American Shoulder and Elbow Society. I'm welcoming you to tonight's virtual fellows conference. This is a 16 week virtual program uh, with Dr. Mazaka and myself. This is an initiative of, our, of our AACS president, uh, <clears throat> Bill Levine. Tonight's session is uh, scapular dyskinesis, how to work up and manage. The moderator is Dr. Ben Kibler. We are, we are joining him as Dr. Bassam Esselstyn, Charlie Getz, and Ilya Velosin. Dr. Kibler, the floor is yours. Thank you all very much. Thank you all very much for joining. I want to thank uh, Shoulder and Elbow for putting this together. I'm really looking forward to this. Especially, we want to thank DGO for sponsoring this program and le letting this happen. Okay, real quick, let's go. What is scapular dyskinesis? It's defined as a altered position at rest or altered motion at use uh, of the scapula, and it is an impairment of normal scapulohumeral rhythm. It's not an injury, it's not a diagnosis, it's not a disease, it's an impairment. And a lot of times it will be associated with the injury process that you will be seeing with the patient. Is it a cause or an effect? Well, sometimes it's both, but anyway. So in general, what we have here, this is what you'll see. On the left is normal, and on the right is dyskinesis. So you got kinesis on the left, dyskinesis on the right, retraction, protraction. You can see the resting position of the inferior medial border, and you see the obviously asymmetrical motion of the scapula. This is an observation. You see this and say, yeah, he's got scapular dyskinesis. I say, oh, well, what's, what's the big deal about it? Well, we're gonna find out. Retraction, which is the normal pattern, has elements of external rotation of the scapula as the arm goes up, posterior tilt of the scapula as the arm goes up, and upward rotation of the scapula as the arm goes into overhead position. On the other side, protraction is a combination of increased anterior tilt, increased internal rotation, and decreased upper rotation, putting the scapula in a position of being unable to do the normal functions of the scapula. The normal functions of the scapula are to be a link in the kinetic chain of force development and motion between the leg and the hand. It is a stable base for maximum muscle activation off of the scapula. It is a dynamically stable socket for the ball and socket to allow the dynamic concavity compression through the full range of motion. And by moving the acromion and the glenoid, it gets rid of the impingement of external impingement or internal impingement. Remember, this is an alteration of an impairment of roles. It becomes clinically significant in combination with other factors, injuries, biomechanical problems, specific tasks or motions such as repetitive pushing or pulling, lifting, throwing a ball. I had one of my colleagues who said, look, Dr. Kibler, I've got a, I've got a scapular dyskinesis. Why do I not have shoulder injuries? I said, Joe, what do you play? He says, I surf and I fish. So he's not going to have problems with his scapula probably because he's not getting his arm into those positions. There are multiple causative factors because this is a syndrome. They, uh, the, the mononeuropathies, long thoracic nerve, scapular, uh, I mean the spinal accessory nerve, joint problems, AC joint problems, arthritis or high-grade AC separations, plantar humeral problems, labral, biceps, rotator cuff, bone problems because if you lose the strut of the clavicle, and then soft tissue problems, which are the most common. They are <clears throat> muscle tightness, muscle weakness, imbalance. Sometimes you get post-traumatic tears. So you can have a universe of thought about how to take how to evaluate this. Here, are, here is the universe of non-operative dyskinesis, pectoralis minor tightness, altered internal external rotation of the glenoid humeral joint, latissimus dorsi tightness, serratus anterior tightness or weakness, core weakness. Actually, 50% of the patients have core weakness because they can't facilitate scapular muscles. Lower trapezius weakness, upper trapezius weakness. There are operative cases of we orthopedic surgeons. We like operative stuff. You can have the pectoralis minor tightness. Sometimes it needs to be released. <clears throat> Any of your fractures of the clavicle that cause a loss of the normal scapular humor rhythm, and I will show you an example of that. Any type of AC, uh, any kind of joint injury, uh, labral rotator cuff, arthritis, I'll show you a case of that, and then snapping scapula, post-traumatic scapular muscle detachment, and then the neurological problems of the cervical discs or long thoracic nerves. There is an algorithm. We've developed an algorithm, just a step-by-step -step evaluation process. Uh, you start with a patient with shoulder pain. If you see them with scapula, observe scapular dyskinesis, as I showed you, 
Then you do what we call corrective maneuvers, and I'll show you this. This establishes whether or not the dyskinesis has any relationship to the clinical symptoms because you can modify the symptoms by doing certain things to mobilize and stabilize the scapula. If that's the case, then you go through the checklist. We'll go through this checklist. These are those, once again, this is the universe of scapular problems. So here's your clinical exam progression. You look at the hip and core weakness or instability. You can do some just simple core stability tests. You palpate along the medial border of the scapula to find deficits which indicate scapular muscle injury. You do your classical muscle strength testing uh, for the rotator cuff and for the scapular muscles. Then you palpate for all the tightness of the muscles, pectoralis minor on the front, upper trapezius, latissimus along the lateral border, and then um, the posterior muscles. The very interesting thing here called loss of conscious control. You have them voluntarily stabilize and retract the scapula. You'll find a lot of times they cannot voluntarily put the scapula in the right position. This is a inhibition uh, that goes on. Then you do your classical lateral humeral joint exam, AC joint exam to look for problems there. Then you look, once again, at your, at your bone, see if there's anything problem there. And then you go to your neurologic exam. Now, you know, you can do these testing, you can go in this order, but this, once again, establishes the role of the scapula and the causative factors. So that's the kind of quick basics here. Anybody, any questions? Uh, Ilya, Charlie, uh, anybody, uh, Bassem, anything to add to this uh, as a brief overview? No, I think it's a brief. Uh, this looks pretty good, um, and we appreciate it. Uh, we appreciate it definitely. It's very nice. All right, good. All right, so let's go into cases. Got a whole bunch of cases to go over. Okay, very first case. He's a PT student, and he's in a class diagnostic testing, and he, he was told that he had this dominant arm dyskinesis. He's all, oh, what should I do about it? So what's the very first question you should ask? Delia, Charlie, what's the first question? This guy walks up. Oh. What's the first question? Well, well, does it bother you? Does yeah. it bother you? How long has it been going on for? <laughs> That's right. Yeah, you say, do you have any symptoms? You know, he doesn't have any symptoms, so he probably serves some fishes, so he doesn't have any trouble. So there's a group of patients who have dyskinesis that's not part of the clinical problem. So don't, you know, remember that. That's just the, the first case. All right, let's get into some symptomatic cases, and I've grouped them by causations. This first group is soft tissue causation. So this is mainly the muscle weakness, muscle stiffness, which is going to be interesting because then you have to do a pretty good clinical exam. So here's got two cases. Here's case one. She's a plant worker. She works one of the uh, auto plants. She does a repetitive overhead pushing job. She's had pain for six months. She has impingement findings with painful arc that is relieved by these scapular maneuvers that I'm going to show you in a minute. Uh, she had, her pain is over the anterior shoulder and along the posterior scapula. She's had the entire workup. You look at this, say, well, she's got to have a serratus anterior problem or something, but it's, it's negative. And she has negative uh, for a rotator cuff. But she has a lot of pain when she tries to do forward flexion. Here's another case. This guy I showed you before, the 30-year-old worker. And he does, he does repetitive overhead lifting and pushing. Impingement, he has weakness in forward flexion. He has pain in this situation, his upper trapezius and along the posterior shoulder. And he's, once again, had the full workup rotator cuff, labrum, all that's entirely normal. No bony injury, but he does have weak hip and core. So uh, in, in these two cases here, um, let's talk a little bit about how you would go working up this page. I've already told you this is not bony, this is not neurologic. So how are you gonna look at these soft tissue problems? For example, how are you gonna look at the pectoralis minor, which is a very common problem here on the front of the shoulder? How do we look at that? So uh, I guess I'll jump on this one first. For pec minor tightness, I, I, I do a lot of that just by inspection of their normal posture. Right. Uh, you know, just it's more of an inspection. And then, um, you know, if it's something that's it's unilateral, <clears throat> I like to take and put both hands behind the head, do almost like a quadrant stretch, uh, what they do for physical therapy on the pec minor, and see if there's a significant um, difference side to side. But, but most, mostly for me, it's an it's a inspection of their posture. Gives me the best sense of their pec minor tightness. And you can see on the right, that right hand guy, you can see that how the whole shoulder blades just kind of leaned forward. Well, one of the major reasons for that is this pec minor gets tight. Now you can palpate the pec minor. You can find the coracoid. It's a muscle that's fairly big, runs down to the fourth and sixth ribs. And it'll be really painful to palpation. You can palpate it here very, very tight, very, very sore. And then, you know, this guy, you can light him up when you touch him along the front of the shoulder. 
So that's a very, that's almost always found in these patients right here. So what about the upper trap and the lat? How are you going to look at that? How are you going to examine for tightness there? I, I still, I think the same. It's a clinical. It says usually almost always clinical. It, in general, in patient to have either paralysis or dysfunction of the serratus or the trapezius, you'll be able to know from at rest the posture of the scapula and you can, from additional testing, decide whether or not these are affected. If patient at rest, they have a prominent of the distal tip of the scapula. In my opinion, this is almost all spectral spinal hyperactivity. And the patient on the right side, when you look at the patient and you look at the right versus left and you see all already bigger muscle, or it looks like bigger, it's not really necessarily bigger, but usually what happened with slight contraction and the scapula tilted forward, it will expose the upper trapezius. It looks as if the patient has a bump almost on the upper part of the trapezius right. and mm -hmm. then you can palpate it. Right. Yeah, you can palpate along these muscles. And once again, just like Charlie said, if you put them on stretch this way, or this way right here, or this way right here, they'll be really, really tight to palpation. So it's a good palpation inspection, put it on stretch, and you can find these muscle tightness. Now, don't forget that, once again, 50% of these patients will have weakness of their hips. So you got to look at a one-leg stability series or some other core stability test because they could not activate this well off a weak hip. So don't forget, in because you'll have a really hard time rehabilitating these if you don't include the hip and core in your rehabilitation program. So I think that's very important. Now these patients do not need surgery. They do, you know, they need rehabilitation, but you have to identify the sources of the problems so that, uh, so that they can do the right rehabilitation. There's a group of patients who have combination of pectoralis tightness, upper trap tightness, and lat tightness with weak hip and core that seem to work as a unit together. And you've got to get them got to get everything loosened up and get the scapula back, get their core strong before you can make any progress. Any more you know, it's that, Ben, it's interesting that there's uh, some physical therapy literature showing that even though dyskinesis as an observation doesn't go away, the physical therapy helps these patients from the symptom standpoint. So the physical that's correct. The, yeah, and I think that's because we're not able to really do a good exam of the scapula um, by just visual, you know, we can't see the, uh, you know, the pre to post, but you're exactly right. So you're strengthening these muscles, you're getting these better tuned up so that the, so that the shoulder can work better. So yes, very definitely, you need to put this in as part of your treatment for the shoulder. Yeah. The only other comment I'd make is that I, I do like to see the, um, the scapulohumeral rhythm, both in the sagittal plane and in the coronal plane. I find it interesting to look at the, the because if, you, if you're in the more of the sagittal plane, you're going to be activating more your serratus anterior to control your scapula for mm -hmm. that motion. And if you're going out in more of a um, coronal plane, it's more of a trapezial um, uh, mediated motion. And I mm -hmm. find that helpful to, to try to, to, to pick up the pick weakness out. between those two muscle groups. That's the only to, pick out, yeah, to pick out which ones you want to start on to get yeah. this better. Both of them are required for normal overhead motion, but you have to decide which one's really the weak one and which ones you need to start with. You're exactly right. So you go look at them from the back and from the side as well. Very good points. All right, let's talk about the tissue injured. Let's talk about something's torn here, some injured. Rotator cuff tendinopathy, labral injury, instability in the joint, biceps. The reason these cause problems with the, the uh, scapula is that there's pain-based inhibition of the muscles or there's avoidance because of the instability of the rotator cuff problem, so we have some compensations. And, but they need to be uh, dealt with because sometimes you can avoid surgery or at least, uh, if nothing else, you can complete your outcome, your best outcomes after surgery. So here's a good case of a worker, once again, 45-year-old worker, one-year history of impingement, He's got arm weakness. He cannot do, he, can, he, he does the, the trunk on the, on the Toyotas. He can't do this all the time because he hurts through there. Uh, he has nighttime soreness, once again, pointing more toward rotator cuff problems. He got an injection subacromial space, a little bit better. No relief by any type of physical therapy, but most of the therapy was the uh, job exercises, the long lever arm way out in front. Uh, he has a tendon injury on MRI of the partial tendinopathy. He was referred to me for possibility of a subacromial decompression and maybe rotator cuff surgery. So here's the exam, and I'll show you these tests I was telling about. 
So he has the pain over the anterior chromium. He has a painful arc. He has soreness right on the front of the shoulder with forward flexion. He has no loss of internal external rotation. He does not have any adhesive capsulitis or other problems like that. Uh, his biceps is not particularly sore. Uh, he does have weakness to manual muscle testing of forward flexion and pain, right? Once again, on the, on the anterior chromium. So let's look at him from behind like we should for all these patients. And the first thing you notice, there is an asymmetry. You see a little bit more prominence of this side right here. You'll notice on the way back down, he will have asymmetry with a large amount of dyskinesis, the entire medial border, type two dyskinesis. He has an upper, upper trap tightness. This is basically what's basically I'm talking about. Look at that big old knot there. That's just where the muscle is, is, is working overtime to try to raise the arm up because the inferior medial border is not being controlled. See how the inferior medial border was not being controlled. Now this is the scapular assistance test. You just assist the scapula to do a posterior tilt and external rotation. And what this does gets the acromion out of the way and gets rid of the external impingement, relieves his symptoms. He has no symptoms now in full range of motion. This scapular attraction test this is how I do it. Stabilize the medial border, take the arm here, and once you test him now, he has normal forward flexion strength with relief of his pain. Therefore, he does have rotator cuff problems, but his rotator cuff problems appear to be associated with the scapular problems. Now here's a, another uh, thrower. This is a thrower with a uh, chronic soreness with acute exacerbation. He threw a fastball and had a pop. He's got soreness along the posterior joint line. He has pain upon abduction and rotation, <clears throat> weakness in external rotation at zero and at 90 degrees. He has internal rotation deficit, all, of, all the findings that the uh, throwers have. He has a positive DLS test, which is a labral injury, and he has a positive MRI. He's had injections without, without any relief. So now, you know, what are you going to do with these two cases? So let's start off these two cases. These are tissue injuries associated with scapodyskinesis. Is it a cause or effect? Does it make any difference? How are you going to treat it? Well, I'll start with the rotator cuff patient. Uh, so I think in this patient, uh, we don't have actual structural injury to the rotator cuff based on the MRI findings. And he certainly has a prominent medial border, especially when we saw him uh, bringing the arm down. And that's probably due to the uh, uh, decreased activity of serratus anterior to stabilize. Exactly right. Border. Exactly right. And uh, you demonstrated that well on your uh, corrective maneuver by a scapula assistance uh, test. Uh, and I think, I think in this patient, rehabilitation would be my first uh, start here uh, to work on his serratus anterior and scapula stabilization program because it's, uh, we don't have a structural damage to the rotator cuff yet. So if we can get the scapula stable and uh, uh, appropriately moving, we may be able to avoid the uh, external impingement that he's having, which is in this case secondary impingement because of his uh, poor scapular control, uh, and uh, chances are this patient is going to get better. Yeah, yeah, what you do, this guy's come set up to do surgery. Hey, doc, you told me, I don't, my other doctor said I need surgery. You know, what, what, how, do, how do you overcome that? What, what do you do in that situation? Well, you educate the patient, but uh, yeah, this, this patients usually come to you and they already had a cortisone shot and uh, you know, they, they went and they did some band exercises, but nobody examined their scapula. So uh, it's easy to jump into subacromial decompression, but the, the problem will remain. So I think it's a, it's a matter of educating the patient and getting him hooked up with the right therapist. Yeah, I found that when you do these things to his shoulder and he can't see what you're doing, but it changes his symptoms, then he buys into the fact that this might work. And I, so they want to give I, I had patients who actually would turn around and say, what'd you do? That's right, <laughs> exactly right. So I think, and this guy did do well. He went back and he was able, it took him about six weeks to kind of get everything tuned up and he had to keep his exercises, but he did do well. He did not need to have surgery. Okay, what about the thrower here? What are we gonna do about, the, oh, the other thing about the rotator cuff, did the rotator cuff cause the dyskinesis or did the dyskinesis cause the rotator cuff problem or does it make any difference? So let me say one thing, make sure that the therapist that you're working with is tuned into your same program. Right. And you work with a pretty consistent uh, therapy group. Uh, because if you send them to somebody that may not be on the same page, they're gonna be like, what are you doing here? You already failed therapy. That's right. Uh, so really, really important that you know who you're having them uh, see. Uh, personally, it doesn't really matter to me uh, whether it was a chicken or egg. 
that's kind of what I tell folks that we don't really know. And that we know though, that if you correct this, the other one gets better. So I, I don't know if I really could tell you what came first. Yeah, my, I don't think, it, I think it's sometimes both ways. I think, yeah, so, but at this time they got to be treated. You're exactly right. Yeah. I right, look, what about the thrower here? What are you going to do with this thrower? You know, he's got this injury. He's, you know, he's a pretty good player. He's, he's in college. Um, you know, he's, he's looking to throw a little bit more. He's got this problem. We know that surgery, you know, for labral injuries is not the best in the world. So what are you going to do with this guy? So, I mean, it, 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 he has had no treatment so far, comes in just at a pop and he's how far from that injury? Right. Yeah. He's, he's about, about two, three weeks from the pop. He's been having trouble all season. Uh, you know, this is kind of a, you know, the acute on chronic type situation. So he's, he's been in some kind of trouble for the last three months. Yeah. You know, you got to figure out where they are in the season, how many more years they have left to pitch, what they're, you know, the, I always, I always tell them there's the medical side to this and then there's the social side to it. Um, it, it for, for depending on where the labral tears, it's a superior labral tear, which I assume is what, what, what you're saying it was. Um, I would always uh, try to get them to do uh, some type of rehab, possibly with an intraarticular injection. And I do think that a lot of them can get back um, that way. And the way I tell them is that um, <clears throat> I want to make sure that we're doing surgery because you can't throw anymore. And we've tried everything to get you back to throwing because mm -hmm. the, the surgery is only to get you back to throwing. If, if they can throw, and they have other uh, problems that may or may not uh, be something surgical, I can only uh, make them worse. So mm -hmm. I want to have him shut down. Uh, but, but granted, if he's not making progress in six weeks or two months, we'd revisit it again. But I, I, I just, um, it's hard to know if this is really that pop is the new injury or if this thing has been going on there for a long time. You know, yeah. you throw his shoulders, you see a lot of damage on these guys. And um, you don't want to overtreat them. Yeah, exactly right. And to see that the, there's good, if you look at the biomechanics of the glenohumeral joint in this abductor external rotation position, you get the humerus going backwards, but you get the glenoid going forward because of the scapular dyskinesis, and there's your internal impingement. And uh, if you get the scapula back, get the glenoid back, and once again, you can do this scapular retraction test. And what you do, you stabilize the scapula in retraction, then you do this DLS test again, and it's negative, then that shows you that part of this problem is due to the glenoid getting in the way, as it were, and you have to move the glenoid back out of the way. This tells you that rehabilitation does have a role to modify the internal impingement. And uh, the other thing is it makes the muscle stronger. So, uh, and there's a, we did a study where we showed about 40% of the non-professionals of these kind of people right here got better in five weeks with physical therapy. Uh, and so I think giving it a shot is worthwhile. Uh, the other thing is he had this internal rotation tightness, internal rotation tightness as you come through, pulls the scapula into protraction, which gets your glenoid going. So you gotta get the humeral rotation, the glenohumeral rotation better, get the scapula back, and that will help a lot of these patients. But very definitely, there are both of these patients here have tissue injury, and if they don't get better therapy, then you've got the other treatment. Any other comments or any thoughts about, the, but these have major roles in this. 90% of patients with labral injuries will have some component of scapular dyskinesis, and virtually 100% of patients with rotator cuff disease will have scapular involvement as well. So you need to document this at the time of your evaluation of these problems. Any comments? Yeah, Ben, I, I'll say that, you know, it's not, it's a little off topic, but, but if you carry this through, especially the cuff, which is, which is so common, I think a lot of people maybe aren't this pronounced with their scapular weakness, but a lot of people that have cuff symptoms have poor lower trap function and yes, are, yes. Have, forced, have just, and that's where the rehab a lot of times should be focused on. So mm -hmm. I think this isn't just for dyskinesis patients, it's for, for patients with all sorts of uh, problems that we should be looking at their scapula more. So yeah, I, I think that's that's a pain-based inhibition that will cause that to happen. Then low trap stays bad long enough, you're going to get the dyskinesis. But early on, you may not see this pronounced. You're exactly right. Yeah. So if, if, I, if I may add, uh, so the way I look at it is the scapula is the house of the rotator cuff. This is the best way. The house itself is the scapula. So anything happen inside the house will affect what's going on around. So many times if the house is affected, whether you have labral tear, whether you have an injury, instability, it will affect the functional activation of the muscle, whether it's pectoralis minor, lower trapezius, upper trapezius, and cause 
a different abnormality in the scapulothoracic motion. And this one should be detected very, very well by a very well detailed exam. Yes, yes. Uh, and I think the exam, it, it's a manual skill, you just, but you just basically take it and you move the scapula, you palpate, you move the joint. It's, a, it, it's pretty straightforward if you practice it. Okay, let's get into this bony issue here now. So now, why does is, why is the bone everything do? Well, the only connection of the scapula to the axial skeleton is the clavicle. It's an S-shaped bone, so that middle, small motions at the scapula, uh, at the sternoclavicular joint, give large motions at the AC joint, and therefore allows you to put your arm in space. Now, you have both shortening, you have angulation, but the main enemy here is malrotation. I'll show you some examples of malrotation of the uh, clavicle due to the fracture. Or if you lose AC stability, then you will have the same loss of the strut. I think in basically clavicle fractures and AC joint separations are both AC separations in that they separate the scapula and the arm from the axial skeleton. The clue on this is once again, the visualization of the scapula in a protracted position. This can sometimes help you decide about surgery. So here's a case. This is a <clears throat> young guy who in six months status post fall, he has a malunited but healed fracture. Uh, and you say, why is he in my office? Well, he's in my office because he hurts. He has impingement, he has a weakness of forward flexion and he can't go in the overhead positioning. And you see from the front, it looks kind of funny, but from the back, you see the huge amount of scapular protraction. Here's another interesting case that you hopefully are going to avoid. This is a 50 year old, one of these guys who cycles everywhere. And he's, a, he's a centurion cyclist and all that stuff. He fell two weeks ago and the fracture itself does not look that bad just on this single AP view, but he was told he did not need any treatment, but he's got, he can't raise his arm. He says, there's something not right about my arm and he's concerned about it. So, um, when in doubt, look at the patient. So uh, he's, once again, he's three weeks, two weeks down the road. He really doesn't hurt too much at the fracture site. You can palpate, it doesn't hurt right at the fracture site. Yeah, there's the hematoma, but you see, look at the drooping, the protraction of the scapula, and this is impingement. This is as far as he can raise his arm, and he hurts out on the acromion. So he has impingement with this motion. Well, why is that? Well, turn him around, and you see, obviously, the protraction, the scapular dyskinesis with this anterior tilt going forward. Now you can reduce this fracture like you normally do. Take the distal fragment and you reduce the fracture and you can stabilize him now. Now have him raise his arm. He says, I can move it and it doesn't hurt because you got rid of the impingement. You didn't do anything about the clavicle fracture, but say, I can do this without any trouble. I can go up to 90 degrees, no trouble. If you let him go, and he says, that's as far as I can go. So once again, as a helpful, who, who needs surgery? Well, this might be one of the ones that you want to consider surgery as an indication because you can change the scapulohumor rhythm alteration. Now, here's a, here's, a, here's a problem. It's shortened clavicle. You can't raise your arm because you get the impingement with the acromion. So here's a, another case. This is a soccer player. Hey, Ben, ben yeah. can I ask a question on that last case? Yeah. Can you treat that? Can you treat his scapulothoracic rhythm non-operatively and get the same outcome? Or do you have to operate on that clavicle fracture? Uh, I, 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 you can always, we try it. We do try it, but once again, how do you get that scapula back by putting a figure of eight on or a sling? It's, it's, it's difficult. This is a, once again, this is a rotational problem with the weight of the arm, all the muscles pulling, everything pulling this anteriorly, rotating around there. And I find it difficult. Now, does it mean it's not impossible? No. And if he heals with the, this position, will he be okay? Maybe. But once again, there's a fairly high number of people with dissatisfaction. And you well know that trying to fix this fracture you know, is, a, is a technical difficulty with lots of complications. So I, I'm being a simple guy, I like to try to fix them early rather than late. I, I would suspect that, that that cyclist had his x-ray on a backboard AP. And now that he's at the weight of his arm, if you got another x-ray with an upright, he's going to have a lot more displacement. Exactly <laughs> right. Yeah. And at least in two weeks, he's, he's been. that a lot of times. Yeah. And once again, showing him what you can do 
uh, what he can do, how much he can change by putting the scapula and the fracture in this situation back in the right place can give you an idea of treatment. You know, you can wait another couple of weeks to see if he calms down a little bit more, if you can get the scapula brace, but I've never found a brace that can put that scapula or that arm back in that position very well. Uh, we can try it. Does anybody have any good tips on how to try to get that scapula back or how to get the clavicle back? Well, if you get to it early, you can uh, if you can, and fix the fracture. You can uh, you can actually see exactly what's going on and interdigitate the fragments. So yeah, that's what yeah. I mean, but other than surgery, now this you know, this guy had surgery and three weeks later he was raising his arm. I got a video of that, but yeah. So but as as a helpful indication for whether who needs surgery, this guy on the X-ray, uh, you know, question. But you see him in exam. This guy, if he wants to have better motion, better scapular humeral position, everything, he needs surgery. And so that's a good indication for surgery in my hands with a plate. Right. Because you don't want this. Once again, here's another one you're going to have to try to do something with or have him live with it. Okay, here's a soccer player. He's got this injury right here. Uh, it's continuous symptoms. Well, again, impingement. But this thing, he cannot run because his arm hurts. He can't run on the soccer field because his arm hurts. And why does my shoulder look that way? So, you know, based on your knowledge of this AC separation, uh, what grade is that? You know, like, you know, is that a, is that a five, three, 150? What, what grade is it? Yeah. You know? Does that help you? <laughs> I want to see if it's reducible. Is this acute? All right. A great question. Fantastic. I can take you to a zero by moving the scapula. Once again, showing that scapula motion and position is the thing that's wrong in those high-grade AC separations. And once again, the way that is this, to me, is a surgical indication for fixing this. Now let me show this, the other guy here. This is a, this is a firefighter. He's three weeks post-fall. He has no pain. He's got this step-off right here. Now, it's not as bad as the other one, but it's a step-off. But look at his scapula now. This guy says, I want to go back to work as a firefighter. And he has no dyskinesis, which means that basically he's got a, probably his, his conoid is still intact and his trapezoid and his ACs are bad. This guy went ahead and, and did normal work. I saw him 11 years later because he hurt his other shoulder and this scapula is still in good shape. So to me, one of the indications for treatment of these and also for classification of these is whether or not the scapula and therefore the biomechanics of the shoulder is disrupted enough to want to have to, to be treated. In this situation, you've got to fix all the things like Gus has showed us how to fix, not this guy, but then the other guy, uh, to, to fix this. Any comments well, about? Yeah, how long do you give for those mechanics to return? Return Because I struggle with that because I'm never sure if it's they're in so much pain that they can't do it from the right, injury yeah. or yeah. Uh, yeah. truly their mechanics are messed up. I, I, I agree with that. The yeah, I'll say three, three four weeks. Worried about. You can, you can still do a really good uh, surgical procedure with all the good tissue and everything. You can do it anytime, but three, three, four weeks, that's going to let everything calm down. The acute symptoms calm down. The muscles start working again. See if you can get this under control. We tried this guy with that, uh, with a, uh, we actually did a scapular brace on him and did some exercises and he never got rid of his symptoms. That other guy that had no dyskinesis, like I said, he flew. He went back to work climbing ladders at four weeks, and he did needed to stay on his exercise program, but he did he did just fine. Now, John, uh, Ben, John Tokish data, 50% uh, get better three months out. Three, four weeks seems a little soon, no? Well, it depends on what you mean by better. I, I've had a lot of talk with JT Don't about that. Don't want to have <laughs> Yeah, well, th th that's maybe a good reason. Uh, and they do scar down. Uh, but if you ask them about their function, it's just like those ones with the malunions of the clavicle. You know, 27% uh, of them don't like that. They're d very dissatisfied with that. And I can wait that long because the operation I do for ACs recon uh, reconstructions is the same acutely or chronically. So I have no trouble waiting. But if they want to get back sooner, then uh, I tend to want to fix them earlier. Because this, you know, these young guys, you know, they, they're they're pretty miserable with that. Scapula doing that. Mm. So once again, you can certainly wait, and I don't have any problem waiting. I know Gus waits almost all of them. Waits, and they have to declare, they do have to declare to me that they want to have it done. So that's why I don't do them within the first week. Okay.
And the result, now the other thing is you got to do the right operation. If you do it the way uh, Gus wrote it up or the way we described our operation, where you actually re redo the entire system, you have to do anatomic CC ligaments, two of them at put exactly where they're supposed to be on the clavicle. You've got to have reconstruction of the AC ligaments as well. So the whole unit, the whole scapular human rhythm works. You don't have you don't have failures there because the whole system is set back the way it's supposed to be. If you try a single dog bone or even do, double dog, dog bones, don't do anything to the AC joint, then that's where you get into your complication rate, and that's when you don't do as well. How do you, how do you anchor on the acromion? How do you reconstruct AP stability of AC joint? Uh, I do two things. Uh, almost always you can find the, if you dissect it out well, the AC ligaments, anterior and posterior AC ligaments are there. They have been avulsed off of the uh, clavicle. If you look at the, um, look at the anatomy of this, AC ligaments are twice as thick on the acromion than they are on the uh, uh, clavicle. And if you look at the MRIs, they avulse off there. So you can find them, you bring them up. Uh, but the other thing you do is I run two uh, 2.4 millimeter drill holes transacromially, and we actually dock the tails of our graft uh, from our CC ligaments, dock it into the acromion. That's your superior AC ligament. Put anchors anterior and posteriorly, uh, little push lock anchors, and you pull those up and you just tighten them out. So you've got anterior and posterior and superior. Therefore, you've got rotational stability, anterior posterior stability, and you have this superior inst stability because you've, uh, you've got the ligaments in the staggered positions exactly where they're supposed to be on the clavicle. It's and a very nice operation. You know, once again, both Gus and ours uh, outcomes are, are superior to the other types of techniques. When you say you dog them, you drill holes in the acromion? Yeah, drill two transacromial drill holes from out lateral to medial, and then you run just stitches. You you, know, you run stitches I through there, so and you dock the, the. Okay. Yeah, but you don't dock them into the tunnels. You dock them into the prepared acromion. You don't make the tunnels that big. You just, the, the two tunnels are to bring the sutures out to tie down over the lateral acromion. You dock it right into the bone. Okay. So it, it's a very stable uh, construct. It's written up in arthroscopy, two thousand seventeen. Uh, our procedure. And so you can use these positions and motions of the scapula to help you decide these tough issues because both clavicle fractures, AC, everybody says, when should you operate? When should you not operate? And this helps you a little bit because it demonstrates the biomechanical problems associated with the loss of the, 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 the bony strut. Any other comments or questions? Uh, ben, uh, what would you do um, in the chronic cases like this, where they have uh, a chronic AC joint disruption, a scapothoracic uh, dyskinesia or abnormality of the scapothoracic motion, and uh, and specifically if they have a fracture that united malunited, so a combination of malunion with the scapothoracic abnormality, would you try to correct it? I send them to you, let you take care of them. <laughs> no, the, the, sometimes you can do that. Uh, if it's a really bad malunion, uh, then you do have to do both of those, and that's much more technically difficult. Um, I've only seen one or two of those. It's always, always been the distal clavicle, way out distal, and so you just got to uh, uh, use that. Uh, use a big, in that situation, I'll use a plate across the top, and I'll... Uh, you know, to, to redo the, to do the osteotomy. And then, but you do have to line it back up because you can't get the AC mechanics right with that um, distal clavicle malunion. So it's a very difficult situation, uh, but I'll I'm use just, a plate. I'm just mentioning it along the same line because I know like a lot of the fellows, they do either fracture and fracture associated with AC joint. And sometimes you fix, you don't fix, you end up with malunion affecting the scapulothoracic motion. Some patients are symptomatic, some patients are not. And just what I mentioned, that in case it's not in the in the talk, this way the uh, the, the attendees will, will know there is sometimes option for this patient if the scapulothoracic is really disrupted because of malunion of the clavicle or the AC joint. Yes, very That's definitely. And and you know those those distal clavicle fractures, they have everything to do with the CC ligaments and the AC ligaments. And you need to you need to understand that the reason why the bones are separated is because the AC or CC ligaments are involved with this fracture, and you have to fix that. You have to neutralize. You know, a lot of times you'll, we'll, we'll actually, as part of the ORIF of the distal clavicle fractures, have to do something to the CC or AC ligaments at the time of the initial surgery. 
uh, that's the way you save yourself the big trouble later on by fixing it uh, to start off. If you don't, if you try to fix that clavicle fracture without dealing with AC ligaments or the CC ligaments, then you have really disrupted the system. That's where you get your clavicle uh, non-union. Yes, thank you. Since we're on the topic of distal third clavicle fractures and, ro and rotational control, how do you guys treat the uh, distal third clavicle fracture if you're gonna fix it, which we, we fix a fair amount of those. I, I personally use the plate to get that rotational control and then I reconstruct CC ligaments. But do, do you use the plate? Because if just addressing CC ligaments is not gonna no. take care of the rotational control. No. Yeah, you have, Certainly. Yeah, I, I put a, I use a plate and then the CC ligaments, but I also make sure that the you know usually that distal fragment has the AC ligaments. So if you fix the distal fragment to the clavicle, you fix the AC joint problem as well. Therefore, you only have the CC ligaments and the fracture, and you can uh, uh, you can tie that. And I, I can do that with the, with the uh, 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 CC ligament reconstruction as well. No, Ilya, really, like it depends also if it is acute or chronic, because if you have acute, it's, it's completely different because the distal fragment is with the CA and the rest, the CC is disrupted. I know uh, Ben mentioned something, but acutely in this situation, you can put a double dog bone just to depress it down, it will reduce it and it's acute and it will heal it because now you're reducing both the fracture and the cycle of, of I don't think we need a plate specifically except if you have comminution, because just by reducing this fragment and, and, and focusing on the CC, you're already re reducing the fracture, which is only a centimeter fracture laterally, and avoiding plate. But the plate definitely will be an option, but I'm not sure necessarily you need the plate in the acute setting. Chronic setting, definitely. But well, I don't think in that's, acute why setting. Asked, that's why I asked this question, because it's certainly controversial. I use the plate because I find that in a lot of these fractures, you have significant rotational protraction of the whole girdle. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. just just doing, I know it's popular to just address CC stuff or just do suture fixation, and good results have been reported with that. But I'm afraid that functional outcomes that were used in those studies do not capture scapular thoracic issues. So yeah. it's just like the other clavicle fractures. You get this anterior rotation, which then allows you protraction. And to me, that's asking for trouble. That's why I want to stabilize the system, the whole system. And if you're going to do what Bassam said, which is fine in his hands, make sure you put them anatomically. You can't just put those screws, right. those, those things anywhere. You got to put them where they originally were to, once again, get the best stabilization for the system. Okay, very good. All right, so let's talk just a little bit about arthritis. This is something brand new in my, in my thought process. Remember that arthritis is a chronic injury. It's got decompensations in the shoulder, shoulder muscles, scapula and everything. You get a stiff joint, so the scapula doesn't work well because of all this tightness. You got pain, you got muscle weakness, all this stuff's going on before you ever operated on this patient. And that doesn't automatically get better just because you put this prosthesis in there because you still have the muscle problems. And here's a case of this. This was uh, contributed by my colleague, Brent Morris. This guy who came to him six mo eight months post uh, reverse with a painful, weak shoulder motion, hurt in the front. He was thought to have a failed, uh, a failed uh, surgery, and he, does he need revision? So once again, you look at him and he stands there and he goes up this way. And that's as far as he can go. He can't go any higher. He's got painful, sore forward flexion. You know, what's going on? Why is that bad? And you see, once again, you see the dyskinesis of the scapula on the way down. It sticks right there. So my partner, so my colleague will do a scapular assist, allowing the, the doing what the serratus should be doing. And now his deltoids is working just fine and he get, get rid of that impingement. So once again, this guy does not have a problem in his joint yet. He's got weakness uh, uh, of the scapula. So, ben, 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 uh, can I ask a question? Fire can away, you, please. Uh, can you tell me uh, what do you mean by impingement here? It's a reverse, right? That's not the shoulder. Yeah. So, yeah. How, so I get, how, how this is an anterior impingement, this one? Well, it's probably not impingement as much as plain old deltoid weakness. Okay. Okay. Because, like, usually they don't impinge anteriorly yeah. in the reverse, right? Yeah. Well, yeah. I was talking about clinical. Yeah, I was talking about something other. But basically, you see how it's dropping down. So he's very definitely his deltoid is not working at all, or cannot work, all for that 
once again, remember, this is a fulcrum. You've got to stabilize the base to allow the deltoid to work. And now the deltoid can work. But see, that, is, that like, is there like a button on the, on the scapula you press and all of a sudden the shoulder goes up? <laughs> yeah. No, you just, you just stabilize the inferior, inferior medial board of the scapula doing what, doing what the serratus should be doing. I'm pretty sure that the serratus is the key muscle of the scapula. When that works, then everything else will be allowed to start working. That inferior, inferior medial border does not work, then you're compensating all the way down the line and you'll get these other problems. So by stabilizing or, or mobilizing that inferior medial border, you can really make the scapula dance and do the right things. This is very interesting. One more was, time that now. Was, that was an impressive exam. I mean, I, I think, I guess what you're doing here is basically increasing the, uh, putting a deltoid on tension that allows him to uh, yes. create. Yes, you're just, you're just putting it up in a position where the deltoid can work. But now what else is, is getting uh, compressed or, or on tension right there? Right there, the acromion and the scapular spine. I'm pretty sure that there's a group of, these stress fractures of the scapular spine that are caused because we're getting into this problem of compression and bending right here. And this is sometimes away from where the, where the uh, screws are. So I'm pretty sure that some of those are the case. Any comments on arthritis? You've got to rehabilitate, even though they don't have any pain, you've got to rehabilitate these muscles to give you the best shoulder function. Any comments or thoughts? Ben, once you have identified this problem, is your next thought just you're going to send the patient to, to focus therapy? Yes. Yeah, and we start off once again with getting the, the hip and core strong because that's going to drive your scapular retraction. And you do everything close to the body. You do all your exercises in here. If you try long lever arm, that's going to tilt that scapula even more. So you do what's called short lever arm. You do everything you know within this range of motion here. You do a lot of... Uh, core stability, scapular traction, motions up to here. Then when they get that under control, then you can go overhead. This, this, will, this particular therapy is gonna take, you know, a couple of months to get everything kind of, it's almost like having to reboot the computer because it hadn't worked in such a long time. Is there any but, role for scapular taping? Oh yes, it's anything you can do to kind of facilitate, synergize those muscles to kind of get them Woken back up, yeah, that, that, those are all good. We use that a lot. So, uh, Ben, um, so if, if we think about the concept uh, that the scapula is the house of the rotator cuff, and when you have a normal shoulder, you're talking about the unit. You just talked about the unit. The unit is the scapula with the rotator cuff and the deltoid, and you have the periscapular muscle working with it as one unit. When we talk about reverse shoulder arthroplasty, many times you have no rotator cuff. You're talking about only a constrained construct with a deltoid. This constrained contract requires scapular motion much more than non construct. Exactly and right. In this case, almost always there is some form of scapulothoracic abnormal motion. The extent of this abnormality is what we need to work on if the patient they don't have this motion. This exactly right. Yeah, and so you can't really tell that pre op because you've got all the arthritis, but post-op you have to. Remember the reason that the reverse works is because you've got a different type of lever system. And it's actually the most effective lever system. You, and, and what it is, it's got a base, a fulcrum, and an emotion. And the motion is by the deltoid. Therefore you have to have that stable scapular base or else the deltoid cannot do the, this motion. That sounds exactly right. You really got to have that capability to make the deltoid work the way it is going to do in this in this reversed fulcrum uh, system, lever system that we have. So Ben, also to add to this, if you take a patient with a normal shoulder and you hold the scapula tight on the chest wall, tight, it will not move. They're mostly in general, except if you keep the scapula down, they'll be able to flex close to fully. If you take a patient with a reverse and hold the scapula well, they cannot flex. <laughs> he will move. And, th and this is my point. This is my point about the stress of the periscapular muscle in this specific setting that you spoke about. Yeah, the, the, scap the arm will not move if you hold the scapula in position, or you'll put force somewhere else, either on the base plate or on the uh, chromium and the scapular spine to get these you know, problems.
Very good. Excellent. Okay, final group of cases here. The nerve and muscle injuries. We got the mono neuropathies, we got the long thoracic, dorsal scapular, spinal accessory. Once again, these are documented well by EMGs or specific findings on exam. And I want to tell a little bit about another uh, example of something that causes really gross scapular dyskinesis, these post-traumatic muscle injuries. So Ely, you want to tell about this guy right here? You're muted, Ilya. Ilya, you're muted. Sorry, sorry. So um, this is a 37-year-old patient who was involved in rollover motor vehicle accident. Uh, and he actually came to me after he had already a couple of surgeries prior to me. Uh, he had subacromial decompression and he had a labral repair. Uh, and uh, on exam, he had uh, profound uh, medial winging of the scapula. Uh, and he had the symptoms now for a period of two years when he got to me. And yeah, that, really, why, why, would, why, would, why would he have a subacromial decompression and labral repair? I mean, we, what, what are the clinical findings? I mean, once again, I don't think that, you know, how, how would he exhibit those symptoms and why would he be thought to have impingement in this patient right here? Sure, well, well he, because, of, because of medial scapular winging and the protraction and the downward rotation, he had basically an external impingement yeah. occurring between the rotator cuff muscles and the acromion. Yeah. Uh, and probably he had some uh, uh, internal rotation deficit uh, and anterior tilting of the glenoid uh, and internal rotation causing a uh, slap injury. So, so those would be the victims of this culprit right here. And once again, all you have to do is exactly what Ilya did here to make that dis discrimination here. Now, um, the, here I'm basically doing a scapula assist test. And I, I have to tell you that this video is taken in the, in the pre-anesthesia area. So uh, this is exam uh, uh, right before the surgery that we yeah. did. But, 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 just, but it, it shows the deficiency. I'm yeah. sorry? Can I ask a question, sorry? So uh, if, if, you, if we want to follow uh, the standard of uh, observation and talking about quote unquote, this kinesia or winking. Honestly, this one does not fit any category. If you uh, repeat the video, the scapula is dancing. It's not going to really medial. If you see at the very end of the video here, notice what he does. This is not very specific pattern at all. He goes in, he starts to dance a little bit, then to do it a second time. And notice now the third, uh, when he said right now, look, bomb, two, one, two, and three. This is a very, very specific situation of pectoralis minor hyperactivity and, and serratus hypoactivity. And in certain patients like this, you are lucky if you try to reduce the scapula and they have good motion because you can have the same exact patient and you try to hold the scapula and they try to resist you because they have such a powerful anterior trapezius uh, hyperactivity and pectoralis minor hyperactivity. It's, it's a great, great example, by the way, for pectoral spinal hyperactivity for me. Well, so this, for example, this guy right here. Once again, you see, now this guy, this guy cannot raise his arm. And he just really, I mean, his, his serratus is just totally deficient. And, and uh, Ilian Bessem, I agree that these problems here are, you know, whatever, by this time, he's got so many decompensations, pectoralis tight and everything. I mean, this particular patient had uh, long thoracic nerve neuropathy on the EMG nerve yeah. activities. So uh, he had uh, documented objective finding of uh, yeah. dysfunctional serratus. Uh, so, sorry, Elia, can, can I ask a question if you don't mind? Go ahead. Can, you re can you repeat the video? Go ahead, Ben. So uh, st uh, stop it here if you don't mind. Okay. I can't stop it, sorry. Okay. But if you don't mind, if you don't want to stop it, What's he here? Once you get to the 150, look at this. He's flexing beyond 90 degrees and there is no scapula abnormality whatsoever. It means the tip of the scapula is moving. His serratus is working. It might be slightly weak, but it is working because he cannot get to this flexion without any abnormality in the 90 degrees. Look at the tip of the scapula is moving forward. So 
I'm just saying uh, it may be abnormal, but definitely not deficient, completely deficient serratus based on this exam. Okay. I might be wrong. Uh, uh, ben, if you showed the rest of the slides I sent to you, it, there's a documented EMG finding. Of yeah, yeah. I, I understand what you're saying, Basim. Uh, but I, th I think there's some variability of medial winging among patients. I mean, I mean, it's even even people with uh, long thoracic nerve injury who 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 have documented long thoracic nerve injury. They sometimes I see them presenting differently. It's not the same in everybody. Yes. Thank you. Yes. So this this next case here. Once again, he's got this. Uh, the the thing that usually tips me off the most is that they. They can't get any higher than shoulder than shoulder level. They they've lost all compensation for um, uh, the serratus. There's nothing. The serratus is not working, so he, you cannot raise the arm up any higher. It's almost like SM's holding a, a reverse against the wall. You, 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 he just can't get any higher. That, that's all there is to it. And so, um, uh, so this this was another long thoracic nerve that was out. I mean, so this. It's a kind of a tell you, before I go to this section, any other thoughts about how you how you work this up? I mean, uh, EMG, you know, what do you do? You look at the exam and you point out these things. But Sam, would you, what would you have done with that first patient? Would you have said, well, you need some more rehabilitation? Uh, honestly, what uh, first, this patient that you showed with it, I call it dancing scapula. What I will tell him, I tell him, I'm not convinced the serratus is abnormal. I will make five, five minute exploration of the serratus to take five minutes exactly. You open it on the distal tip and you examine it. And I have a lot of patients like this who stimulate the, the serratus contract. I take a video, show it to the patient, and I do pectoralis minor release. That's it. But if the serratus at the time of surgery is a truly abnormal, which I really doubt, then I can tell the patient at the spot, I will do for you pectoralis transfer. Okay. You like pectoralis minor transfer. Okay. Pectoralis um, minor. Yes. The, the, okay. So... Pec minor gets tight. How often do you do a pec minor release on scapulodiskinesis patients? Uh, not in this case. Like in very specific patients with pectoralis minor hyperactivity, I, I think I've done at least 60, 50, 60 probably. Did you correct? It works, re works really well when you need it. Like this patient, for example, uh, Elia, and I understand, but whenever the scapula start to dance, these are the patients I worry about the most. And these are the one I try to do the less better than more because he already has surgeries and stuff like this. So only as an advice, if we explore the serratus and take a video of it, you can confirm everything. You can either do the pec transfer or pec minus release only. So wait, do you, wait, wait, how do you explain this to me? How do you confirm the activity of serratus when you expose it from well, the- Well, uh, usually if, even I can release the pectoralis minor with the lateral position. You put the hand behind the back, it wing the scapula of the chest. You make a smiling incision at the very distal tip, only five centimeter. Retract latissimus distal, you're on the serratus. You yeah. take a nervous stimulate, a muscle stimulator, like the checkpoint, and you see the contraction. I take a video. And very sincerely, out of these patients that I had this on, I don't, not in a single one, I did pec transfer. All of them, the muscle was working. So I did ended up doing only pectoral spinal release. Is there such thing as high, high, hypoactivity of serratus? So meaning, meaning it's not completely dysfunctional, it functions somewhat, and yet yes. you have, yes. so yeah. in those cases, you don't think a PECT transfer is the way to go? A, a PECT will be one alternative. Otherwise, I'll do scapula pexy. I do a, a, a tendon allograft around the tip of the scapula and tie it to, the, tie it to one rib, and I'll rehab him over three to six months. You, you yes, so on, the ones, on the ones where you release the PECT minor, uh, do you, do you correct the scapula dyskinesis? In around eighty oh. percent. Yeah, the problem with the with the long thoracic nerve, it's long. It gets stretched. If you do this protraction long enough, you can get some changes in the long thoracic nerve that may may not be the the, the real problem. And and sometimes if you can correct that, you know, I, I I've done a few pec minor trans, uh, releases and they work really really well in these, I call them dystonic of these dancing scapulas, but you, the only reason you do that is then you can create the position where the serratus has a chance to work again, and it's hard to, to get that, and it takes a long time for that to get better. We're running out of time, got one more case here real quick. This is a um, 30, 21-year-old girl, three years post-MVA. Uh, she has pain along the medial scapular border, arm weakness. She's had injections, therapy, 
MRIs, EMGs are all negative. And if I do this scapular assist, scapular retraction, she's better. You can see along the side, she has a decreased muscle bulk on this side. And then once again, you see the gross dyskinesis. And you see these little areas of decreased muscle bulk right here compared to the opposite side. You see, and she hurts right there, right where the muscle bulk is gone. That's where she hurts, the high level of pain compared to the opposite side. And so this is a, a, she has to meet all these clinical inclusion criteria. Once again, do I push my magic button right down here and the arm moves like it's supposed to. And she gets relief of her symptoms. So this is a good test to, to uh, identify that. Okay, so we've kind of discussed all this. This is, a, this is a difficult group of patients. You need to really examine them well. EMGs are your only real clue, but they don't, they don't help all the time because sometimes they don't get the right muscles, especially in the trap injuries. Sometimes you see obvious trap atrophy from the spinal accessory. You do an EMG, it's normal because they went into the rhomboids because the trap's so small. So this is a, just a really good clinical uh, diagnosis. Uh, any uh, tips here? Bassam, I know you do a lot of this. Uh, Charlie, you've been kind of quiet. So any other comments about these particular problems? These are tough. Well, I, I asked it. Sorry. Someone said, okay, no. I don't rely on EMG except as, a, as after the exam because uh, even our EMG, many times they don't want to go to the serratus. And in many instances when the EMG was even party positive, if it is complete paralysis, paralysis. Like if they say complete, yes. Many times the EMG comes, some neuropathy of the long thoracic. What does it mean, some neuropathy? What does it mean exactly? Is it denervated? Is it like, you know? And many times this is how it comes. And when you examine this patient, you can almost determine whether or not the serratus is involved or not. And these are the patient I explore them. If the patient like the one that you showed the posterior rhomboid tear or something like this is a different category. And, but I don't always rely on the EMG except if they tell me, the nerve is involved. It looks up. Like you have the fibrillation and muscle paralysis. And regardless of these patients, the exam is very, very clear. But those who are borderline, I honestly, we have to make sure before we go into PEC, even the PEC work, by the way, because the PEC is like your hand when you do the scapular compression test. This is a PEC. But if you can do something smaller to have the same outcome, why not? Okay. So is that so just wanted to make one suggestion, we're picking my brain. One type topic that we really didn't talk about, and I don't want to open up a whole can of worms, but one of the more common reasons for uh, scapular winging is Parsons-Turner syndrome. And I think some of the things we've discussed are actually more uncommon. And I probably see that at least a couple times a year uh, with a very predictable uh, pain. And then the pain gets better and in flaccid paralysis. And so this will, this will be something that comes into your office uh, and, and be on the lookout for that. So I just wanted to make sure we made that, that um, was included. Great point. Once again, the, the, kind of the key points there, really bad burning pain in the neck and thoracic area up through here. They just hurt like the dick. It's just really bad burning pain. Then a couple of weeks later, they can't raise their arm. Now, the large majority of those will go ahead and eventually get better. But the, once again, that's where you get into this dancing scapula an awful lot where that long thoracic nerve gets really damaged and banged up for a long time. And then it doesn't automatically return. You've got to retrain those muscles after that effect. So, you know, remember that really bad burning pain uh, is a very good uh, clinical finding. I, I just want to add very quickly, the only muscle that, if you think about the serratus compared to any muscle in the body, is the only muscle if you try to move, it's always in constant stretch. So sometimes I feel only theoretically, I might be wrong, that when the nerve get uh, personal Turner syndrome, it get paralyzed and then start to recover. During this period, the muscle keep on stretching. It may keep on stretching. Then when it comes back, you do an EMG, the EMG is normal, but the patient is big time windy. You have a big scapulothoracic abnormal motion. And you try to explain it, you cannot explain it. In my opinion, other than the nerve being stretched, I do believe this muscle, because of its anatomy, it's capable of also of stretching over time. And when it recovers the nerve, it may not recover the length to give you the nice excursion to get the serratus scapula to place. Yeah, and you're exactly right. But you can retrain that, and you have to retrain it by using the core as the facilitator. You do hip and core exercises and scapular retraction. That's how you turn that muscle back on. That also puts it in the shortest period uh, with the least amount of load. But yeah, you're exactly right. That takes a long time for that muscle to, to That's right. be better. 
All right, guys, that was an amazing discussion. Uh, our hour's up, and uh, I want to thank everybody for uh, attending tonight, and especially our panelists. That was uh, just tremendous. Ranjan, anything to add? Thank you, everybody. This is going to be something watched over and over again. Uh, I very much appreciate all your time and effort and willing to serve the ASES. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you. you. Good night, everybody. Good night. Good night. Good night.